So, whenever someone says to me things like the Yamato class, they come out of the blue. No one could have seen them coming. I honestly wonder if that person has actually bothered to read about Japan at all, about their history in the 20th century at all. Because if they had, well, uh, there are a few good cl clues about what's coming. There is... The key class, which were going to have 16.1 inch guns, and they were going to be very fast. And they were part of the A-8 fleet put forward by Prime Minister Hara Takashi. The idea being they would have 16 ships in service by 1927. So, not an onerous construction program. I doubt they would have achieved it by 1927, I think 1930, probably. But, um, yeah, they could have achieved it. Now, this was, of course, going to involve the Amaki class, the Gato class, and the Key class. But most importantly, most importantly... To what we refer to as the number 13 class, because these ships were never given a name. They are drawings of them. The current book I'm pointing to a lot, the uh, Brea book. I could also point to others. Um, these are possibly some of the most interesting Washington cherry trees. And you'll see that design better, because these vessels, eight 18-inch guns, eight 18-inch guns, 47,500 tons in normal displacement, speed of 30 knots. Thirteen inches of armor belt. If anyone's wondering what the differential between them and the Amatoa class is, that kind of gives you a clue. So, the number 13 class. They were going to be... the absolute key for the Japanese, the, the core four. And this is when it gets quite funny, because we know about these, because the Japanese need to plan a long way in advance, because they need to build up their infrastructure to build them and maintain them, and they're working on that. We don't know what the American response will be, because the American construction plan doesn't go out as far as 1927. We have no idea what the British response is going to be, because the British response goes out possibly, you could argue, as far as 1925, 24, considering the pace of construction the British put in. So, we are talking in terms of class equivalency, in terms of production. The Japanese are talking not the next, gener uh, next class of battleships, not the ne uh, next, next class of battleships, but their successors to them. So, we'll be talking about whatever ships the US Navy would have completed or even started after South Dakota's would have been their equivalent. And for the Royal Navy, it's whatever they finished after the G-freeze and N-freeze. So... Again, some of the quotes about them, that they would have been the world's most powerful battleships when they were launched, etc. We honestly can't say. Because... If you're saying that, you're presuming that the British build the G-freeze, the N-freeze, and go, you know what, we're not building anything more. At all. And the Americans build the South Dakotas and Lexingtons and go, we finished. Now, honestly, there is a clue, though, in some of the authors' writing, because they tend to use the phrase European battleships, and I do wonder if they are comparing it to the French and the Italians, and Britain and America don't count in that phraseology. I'm not sure. But this is 
one of the interesting things you have with some of the Japanese systems, and where in many ways they are almost they are far more worthy of some of the statements which get made about especially German systems in terms of German uh, wonder weapons like the H class etc. They are far more worthy of that discussion than their German counterparts. Because the Japanese are actually building the infrastructure to build these ships. They're not just talking about it. They're not just doing pretty drawings on paper and going, we could build something super and massive. No, this is a realistic design. This is a design they can build with a slight enhancement of their infrastructure. They can do it. They can do it. Shameless book plug here. Really interesting what if in this group is not this vessel. As much as I love the Trevor class, they're really cool. But they were all built. More being built would have been an interesting what if for World War II. The battle class, the war emergency ships. But the daring class. I often think if more of them had been built after World War II, more of the class had been completed by the government. I wonder whether the Royal Navy escort force would have shrunk so, because it would have got so used to having destroyers in parts of the world and politicians and governments relying on those destroyers for presence. Would they have had, what impact would they have had? Saying all that, rather like when I'm talking about the Francisco Caracolla class, uh, the almost built vessels of the Italian Navy being the potentially the most impactful on world events, and I do think they would have had a major impact on world events if they had been actually completed. I would argue that the number 13 class, if they had been built, Whatever the construction the Americans and the British are building, and I have no doubt it would be an equivalent, would set the tone for how battleships would develop for the following 20 years. There is a point which is really scary there to think about in terms of, and when I mean scary, I mean in terms of the impact upon history and how the world could have changed, because... If the treaty system holds off till 1930, if no one does the treaties until these things are underwater and then suddenly people worry about the treaties, the world of battleships that you would be looking at would be completely different. 30 knot speed would probably, 28 knot speed would be considered entry level, 30 knot speed would be considered normal. Armour. That would be a key. Uh, that would be a key part of it. I haven't done a key ships on the key class yet. I will. I will do one on them as well at some point. I haven't done one on the Gato class either. So I will do the entire eight eight fleet because it's an interesting group. So uh, expect to, to see those turn up. I don't, I'm not sure when. Maybe um, series seven and eight over Christmas. But the thing is, if you have these ships in the water, and the likely counterparts from Britain and America, that changes the goalposts so dramatically for trying to build something better than them. It changes the entire composition of what could have been World War Two, Because, I honestly think, even if you have a treaty system in 1930, I think some of the existential issues that are coming about in Germany, in Italy, with the rise of Mussolini, with the fascism in Europe, but also with the militarism in Japan, even if they don't have the treaties limiting them, Hara Takashi is killed before before the, the treaties even agreed. 
It's just... Japan has issues. Okay, Japan at this period has issues. If it was... If it was a group of friends at a table down the pub... Please excuse this sort of scenario, but I want to give you something to sort of think about. You would honestly wonder why they were still sitting at the same table. Because they are fighting and are so... There are groups in there who are so unable to even possibly consider the idea that others might have a valid opinion. Anything other than their own review. Uh, there are some good books. I have been reading this recently, Japan at War in the Pacific, by uh, Tootle. Uh, it and a whole slew, including um, Kaigen up there, are very good works to get an idea of what Japan was like in this period. It's not good. It's really not good. But the thing is, why are they building this fleet? Why are they building these ships? Why are they trying to make these ships as individually powerful as possible? Why are they building a fleet? In response to the American plans for building... Ten more battleships and six battle cruisers. Why are the Japanese wishing to have four strong battleships, four strong battle cruisers, Nagatos, the Amagis, and adding eight fast battleships? One class faster to back up the battle cruisers. They are the key class. And one class slightly slower. But a lot more powerful to back up Nagatos. Twelve ships that can really fight in a battle line. And twelve ships which can be used as fast tarsals operating. It's kind of a division between the American and the British battle philosophies post World War One, really. Well, it's quite simple. It's the Japanese version of the Terence, and it is like the Risk Fleet Theory, but it's a theory which has existed before the Risk Fleet Theory. The Japanese have been operating for a long point, long time in this period, uh, by this point, period, on the idea of making themselves a tough pill to swallow. They know that they cannot defeat the industrial and logistical mights of the largest powers. They include America in this at this point, but they also include Britain. Now, Britain is a traditional ally by this point, but Japan does also remember that Britain hasn't always been the best nation to them. Britain is happy to be the best nation to them as long as they balance out their other problems. But if Britain perceived Japan as a problem, Britain has a very large, very capable navy and a large, very capable, well, a vast array of very capable soldiery to call upon. People usually at this point go, oh no, the British Army, it's traditionally quite small compared to others. Yes, it is, but there's also the British Indian Army, the Australian Army, the South, American, uh, the South African Army, the Canadian Army. All the vast em armies of empire, the African rifles, all the troops that they can call upon, the Gurkhas, there are lots of them. And... You'd be amazed at how happy governments are often to expend other, other countries that owe them fealties lives. If we're being cynical. They don't like to lose anyone, and it's a political cost every time you do it. And everyone knows that, honestly, especially after World War One, but even the Boer War, you do it if you have to, but it's going to cost you politically with those colonies. It's going to cost you. It's going to have a price. So you have to decide if it's worth it. 
And because of that, and because of the system of government in, governments in America, especially, and some of the perceptions Jan, Japan has over the roots of the American Civil War, because one interesting thing is the Japanese get a very interesting perspective on the American Civil War because they hire quite so many former Civil War officers from both sides. It's often portrayed as being primarily Union officers, but they, they hire others as well to train their army and to train their forces in general. They get quite an interesting perspective over uh, the solidity of the United States because of that. And so the Japanese have this idea, if they make themselves as hard a pill to swallow as they can be, not such a force that they are a f really a threat to anyone. No one thinks they're going to be able to go out and beat up, go offensive and attack, the, attack America or attack Britain and go wage a war against them. No, but something which is defensively strong enough that if you take them out, it's going to cost you a lot. And so you have to ask yourself, is this worth it, or shall I go after weaker opponents? And this is a classic example of that idea, because it's got eight 18-inch guns. Now, these 18-inch guns, they're capable. They're planned to be 18-inch 50 cal. I'm not talking about the 18-inch guns, therefore, which appear on the Yamato class, although they are the origins of the Japanese's own foray into developing 18-inch guns. So, it's something to think about. But 18-inch, 50-caliber guns, eight of them, each capable of firing a... One and a half ton shell, pretty much. Uh, well, 1,550 kilograms, so 50 kilograms over one and a half tons. At roughly 800 meters per second. Um, I'm not sure about you, but the kinetic energy alone of that impacting on me would have a misting effect. It would have been a very powerful weapon system. More powerful than the 18-inch guns on the entries. Probably. Honestly, probably. What would it have had an impact on in terms of development of things? Well, if you've got 18-inch 50s in the world... Everyone's going to be upping their guns. I wouldn't be surprised if you ended up with a two tier. And some people might even try and go for 20 inch guns. Some people might. They'll then be very, very disappointed. Because the rate of fire will be absolutely atrocious. It's doable. It's doable. But the rate of fire... Once you get a little above 80... Sufficiently above 18 inches, the rate of fire starts to drop off very quickly. People often find this weird, but it, the example I give is actually the 10-inch gun, okay? Because theoretically, the 10-inch gun is the best of both worlds. It's like the fourth rate in the ship age of the line, uh, in, the, in the age of sail. You know, fourth rate ship of the line. In that, 10 inches, theoretically, is fast enough firing to be a cruiser gun, small enough, uh, large enough to be a battleship weapon and give a cruiser a very good hit. The reality is the 10-inch has pretty much the same rate of fire as the 12-inch and almost the same rate as the 14-inch. I know the 12, difference between 12 and 14-inch and even to an extent once you get into 15-inch is close enough that, frankly, that you sort of go, well, the 10-inch has no advantage in rate of fire over those. Whereas the 8-inch is a lot faster firing and nothing up to about 9.2, 9.4 inches is still a lot faster firing. Then you consider the impact. Well, 
If you're dealing with a 9.2 inch versus a 10 inch, yes. There are various laws which tell you that a 10 inch is going to be a bigger, more powerful shell. But is it big enough and powerful enough when put in contrast to that rate of fire in terms of ammunition delivery to be justified? It's rather the same when you reach a higher limit than 18 inch guns. If you consider going up your rate of fire, the higher you go, the heavier the equipment gets, the heavier the shells get, the more machines have to work. And the more you start to reach the end of your engineering ability to maneuver these uh, these shells the wep and the weapons as well, the guns and the barrels, in this space in a sufficient enough time. Because... If it's so heavy, you cannot move the turret quickly enough to track the enemy ship. Even if it's a long way away on the horizon. If it is, the rate of fire is too slow for you to accurately manage to correct your fire, so you can actually start hitting the target. And if it is not providing with enough shells splashing down to actually give you a mathematical chance of hitting, you have a problem. I'll get into this more when I'm discussing HMS Incomparable because there are many issues with her and frankly those issues have been shown by the Battle of Jutland. But the thing about number 13s is they have 8 guns, not 6. They have 8 guns. And... They're 18 inch guns. Yes, they're 50 cals, but that's going to make them heavy to move around, but it's doable because they're twin turrets. So the weight is going to balance out. You've got not as much gun as you would have in a Yamato with its three guns in the turret. You can do this. What is also interesting about design is, in many ways, it's a logical progression of the Queen Elizabeth class. And it's a logical pro progression, therefore, of the discussions the then captain, uh, Yuzura Hiragara, had. He'd go on to become Vice Admiral Baron Yuzura Hiragara. Um, head of the engineering school of Tokyo Imperial University. He was their leading naval architect in the 1910s, 1920s, and basically the entire family, Nagato, Amagi, Ki, and number 13s, are pretty much his designs. There's some arguments on those put forward by the Nagato class how much they are his designs and versus a sort of combination, but the key class, the Amagi class, they are definitely his, they are entirely his designs. And number 13 is definitely. And he's a very skilled naval architect. There are lots of differences between this class and the Yamato class, but they are definitely leading towards the Yamato class. The Yamato class are what are produced when you've had 20 years of curt uh, curtailment in terms of your construction abilities by treaties. When this is what Japan was building up its infrastructure to build in the early 1920s. And they were planning on building them at Yokosuka. Yokosuka Naval Arsenal, um, Kyo Naval Arsenal, Mitsubishi in Nagasaki, and Kawasaki in Kobe. The really interesting thing is you can tell this one's going to be a fast battleship. This one's just is a battleship in this period. It's 27 knots top speed. They same have the same shaft horsepower. This one weighs a lot more, but it's also it's shorter by roughly 11 meters, which is a has a big factor 
especially when you're also nine meet well eight point one ish meters beamier and you've got a deeper draft. This is all an impact on your operational capabilities. This class are designed to be the cornerstone of a fleet. They are designed to be the cornerstone of what Japan would deploy. They're also, and I say this with all deference to the people who served on the Yamato class, they are designed by Japan which has a clearer vision of what they want them to do. The Yamato class are supposed to be this big statement to the world of Japanese strength that they also then end up hiding. It doesn't work. You can't build something as a deterrent and then hide it. Because it won't deter anything. Deterrents which people don't know about do not deter them. Surprisingly enough. It's why if you have cameras or securities for your house, you stick up signs saying you have them. People can clearly see it. Now, some people would say, well, that acts as a big beacon to tell people to come here. I've got something worth defending. True. It also acts as a big, if you do come here, you've got to deal with issues. It's also the same as casually having a load of maces and uh, swords dangling in the windows. I'm not talking about Castle Drakenafell now. Uh, but, you know, my shipshape crew, they're, we're all, all of us are interesting people. My fellow shipshape crew are. Each of us has our own ways of deterrence. This is all about deterrence. She's got a high speed. She's going to have a decent range. The whole purpose of this class was to be big and visible. And let's be honest, these lines are pretty, uh, pretty gorgeous, aren't they? Long, elegant, every gun the largest you can build. 5.5 inch 50 cals for a secondaries. 4.7 inch AA guns. She's got it all. 8 18 inch guns. We know about this design because the Japanese have to start planning the infrastructure, construction, to even have a chance of completing these on time. They have got the Amagis under construction. The keys are beginning. This is the next class. And they're going to build them. And they could build them. Would they have been the most powerful battleships in the world when they launched? I'm not sure. I'm fairly certain, considering Japanese pace construction, they will get beaten to launch by the British and the Americans. Because of how long it's going to take them to build them. But do I think they will immediately signal that Japan is in the technological realms of the other two? Yes. Do I see Japan carrying on building a massive fleet? No. Because the one thing the Japanese are realistic about is their own ability to build a fleet. You know, you only have to look at the wording and the discussions going on around the increase in the Diet from the 4-4 to the 8-8 group. They are being honest about it. They're considering its value. It is all about making them a stronger nation. Not in an offensive sense against the major powers, but certainly weaker nations. The same thing which makes them a tough, a hard pill to swallow for a large nation, makes them a sledgehammer for a smaller nation, or rather a less well-armed nation. And they are not opposed to that. 
They are a nation which has come of age in terms of their communications with the world after many, many centuries being shut off in a period of intense colonization and intense marginalization of some very old civilizations. As the modern powers, as they turn themselves, the major powers, as they called, like to call themselves occasionally, the powers which were, had industrialized the soonest and were able to bring the capability with them, brushed them aside. And that, that has an impact on Japan. When Japan talks about we are facing a terminal threat to our way of life, to our cultural identity, you can understand them because they are looking at other countries and what's happened to them. You can also understand that they are looking at what they're doing to other countries as well and they're presuming the major powers will do it to them. Depends which major power you're talking about, but yeah, there are chances. There is a chance. So it makes sense. Now, I was thinking of trying to model this in UAD, Ultimate and Order or not. And if I manage to get a model I'm happy with, it will appear. So, here we go. We have a lovely atom at roughly 50,000 tons. Not 47,000 tons, but honestly, I'm not too worried about that because the, probably the reason for the differential weight is the height of the um, guns. The UAD option that I had to use for designing the hull didn't allow me to put this aft turret down here, so this turret wouldn't. Well, well, basically these, this turret would have got, this gun would have gone down here and there would have been no build up here and basically once you're including stability factors, 3,000 tons for that change is roughly no skin off anyone's nose. And um, otherwise, 30 knots, 18 inch guns, 18 inch 50s as designed. And we have the torpedoes. Now. This, of course, is a modernized variant because, well, UAD doesn't allow me to give 40, give 18-inch guns to things in the 1920s. So I've had to build it as if it's been modernized. So again, five, uh, modernized and being only 50,000 tons versus 47,000 tons, not bad. Not bad at all. And that's me being honest about the modernization. Now, over here, we have also modernized uh, South Dakota. Yeah. 23 knots. Realistically, would never be out solo, but that will just exacerbate what I suspect might happen. Because this is 12 guns. And this is 8. And whilst this has a range advantage... It does have a range advantage. It's not that much of a range advantage. And it's one that can be eaten up quite quickly. Now, admittedly, her cruising speed is 24 knots. And firing speed is 24 knots. Which means, theoretically, with the South Dakota having a maximum speed of 23 knots... She can always theoretically keep out of range. However, uh, that's theoretical, that's a one knot advantage on the cruising speed, and that's her best firing for long range firing. If she wants to go faster than that, she can do. Remember, this is a 30 knot fast battleship. So, if she gets close to the South Dakota, the South Dakota is going to swamp her. So she has to keep at maximum range to stand a chance. Now, this does fit with both Japanese and American doctrine to keep at such range. But, really, it's not a good scenario. Because 
any damage that ship receives, this thing can overwhelm it. And it's almost getting up to maximum range. But it's 18 inch guns. And if an 18 inch shell hits. Well. She won. Um, what I will do. Is we'll play again. We'll go for it again. This time I will leave the AI completely in control. Both have been slightly adjusted in terms of their designs to fit with UAD, so both have slightly heavier um, decks. So that they have the same stability profile for long range gunnery, because when I programmed in the system, and I literally program. What I always start with, okay, when I'm doing these, is I program in to UAD as accurate, historically accurate figures as I can. And then I adjust from there. And whatever I do, I ensure I adjust both to an equal op op option of their realism. And the realism that's important is their operating characteristics. The guns have to be as realistically accurate as possible. Their operating characteristics in terms of their stability has to be realistic as possible. But that means their armor is going to go slightly up and slightly down. Sometimes they'll have less armor on the ends in an, than they normally would have done because I need to concentrate that survivability in the center to provide the stability for the firing. Now this is fast battleship versus battleship. Very solid battleship and yeah. Well armed. But those are eight 18 inch guns. And this is 12 16 inch guns. Now, why am I making a discussion of this? Because I think after this video comes out, in fact, I'm sure after this video comes out, there's going to be some more videos, and then there's going to be HMS Incomparable looked at. Now, Incomparable, I can't, don't have a 20 inch gun in Ultimate Animal Dreadnought, so I've had to do a simulation with the guns. And one of the things you note very quickly is because she's only got six guns. Even though she has six 20-inch guns, or in this, in the case of the XI, six 18.9-inch guns, she's overwhelmed. If she gets within stand any thing like the combat ranges, she probably ended up with even against a 14-inch gun, well, 14.9-inch gun battleship in the simulation. This is an 18 inch gunship versus a 16 inch gunship. They've got into even firing range now where the 16 inch gun can fire back. And, well, I think you're gonna see the problem very shortly because it's the volume of shells coming in. Eight versus 12. It's not a two to one superiority in numbers of shells, but combined with a rate of fire, that's slightly faster because again the machinery is much the same and the humans involved are still roughly the same in terms of their experience their training their knowledge all these things so it's gonna be take more time to move the 18 inch shells load them up etc it's gonna be hard, far heavier machinery to move them up than it is the 16 inch shells So the 16 inch shells are going to be quicker to load and fire, and you're firing more of them when you fire. So you do have an advantage in that regard, but this is 18 inch guns, and it's able to start firing from slightly further, or further away, because it's an 18 inch 50 versus 16 inch 50. So that's the other thing to think about, that's an 18 inch 50, that is not the Yamato, Yamato gun, as I pointed out before, that is an 18 inch 50. If that comes into the world, that's a very scary thing in the world. 
and Indiana here is doing her best. But again, if we were doing realism, I'd be having to put together roughly, well, probably a fleet of roughly 20, 24 battleships on the American side and a dozen or so on the Japanese side and having them fight out and see what the battle line does. Add in a whole load of cruisers. It makes it a very interesting fight. But of course, there would only be four of these, and UAD doesn't allow you to stack in multiple designs, so... You can't realistically do that. And if you did four versus... four of these versus the, let's say, the six South Dakotas... I think uh, the Indiana's ammunition just went up, judging from that explosion. There again, I'm not sure how much better number 14 is doing. Number 14 is blasting away as well as she can. Indiana's gone. But that's a lot of damage 14's taken. And the thing is, that's a lot of time to repair. Anyway, hope you found this interesting. And I'll add on to the question I'm going to add in a second, ask in a second. If you would like me to do a UAD simulation, stick up a four of them versus six of them and see what happens. I'm happy to. But comment below and I'll record it and post it as a little extra video at some point. I hope that answered your some questions and gave you some interesting ideas and to think about. Um, I recorded the question when I first put the video together, but um, I wanted to have a little bit of a summation section after the video if it worked after the UAD stuff. You see, we have these wonderful tools to do and to use now. Uh, we can do all this interesting history where we can test things out more than we ever used to. More than we ever have been before. There are limitations to that. Okay, uh, UAD has a veterancy component to its its computing, which you can play around with, but that doesn't give you the full range of potential scenarios. But it's still useful for an illustrative purpose. And that's the point, really, for history. It's to hold a mirror up to the present. It's to give us an illustration of what options have happened. Also, I wanted to add in a little bit extra about something which has been going on in my channel lately. I noticed quite a few people were adding in comment, were using comments for the logarithm. And it's really useful if you do comment on a channel, on a video for, a lo for the logarithm. It doesn't matter whether it's a small channel like mine, or it's a massive channel like... Well, I'm going to use my best friend when I use this, and in sort of, you know, Drac, and he's mentioned his channel as one, because... It is a very big channel, and because I can mention him without people saying that I am trying to garner any favor or anything with him, because we already go away on naval history trips together. Nicest way, there is no way I'm going to be able to garner favor. He has seen me at crack of dawn in the morning, where I look very, very scary, and I am going around a breakfast room going, uh where is decent bacon? Where is decent bacon? So, in the nicest way, there is no... Uh, if he's still friends with me after seeing me in that in that scenario uh, for now, a month last year and a month this year, it's just, you know, it's life. So it doesn't matter whether it's uh, my channel or his channel. And my channel, of course, I have the thing of that my aunt has moved the target to 15,000 subscribers. For those who don't know, my mum and my aunt are lovely people. 
and they do not bet, but they do have friendly competitions over the family, and they're twins, okay? So there's a level of competitiveness going on. And, um, yeah, so traditionally my aunt had the bet that if I got reached 10,000, what I would, if I reached 10,000 subscribers by Christmas, etc., my mom would, uh, you know, she, if she if she didn't, if I didn't, then she won, and there's some baked goods which go back and forth. If my mum wins, then my aunt has to do some things. Leaving that to one side, um, it's just, it's not money or anything like that. It's bragging rights, purely, mainly. And anyway, my aunt has managed to win the bet for the last couple of years, because it took me a while to reach 10,000 subscribers, which I wasn't to an extent surprised by, but I would, was hoping to get there a bit sooner. And, uh, yeah, I got a bit close last year. So, um, she moved the goalpost to 15,000 subscribers. This is coming out in August. I'm on 10,200. I would need to put on... I need to gain some region of 5,000 subscribers by December the 24th to make sure they're still there on December the 25th when the, when the, when the actual important thing is to somehow win that. Basically, it's a feat equivalent to... I don't know. Germany managing to build enough... Uh, build enough battleships to a actually win World War I at sea without investing in their infrastructure and growing their infrastructure. It's the equivalent of... Well, we're talking about Japan, Japan's point. It's the equivalent of Japan, perhaps, you know, not uh, managing, actually building the number 13s rather than the Emotos, or a modernized version of the number 13s rather than the Emotos in 1937-39. Because, honestly, I think that would be very cool. But I think a modernized version of the Emotos, of the number 13s, to what the Emotos level of armor, ooh, that would have been... That would have been an interesting vessel. But anyway, that's not today's question. Although it was tempting us. It was tempting. Thank you very much, and I'm going to pass you back to an earlier version of me. For t but today's question is what do you think the American and British response to the number 13s would have been? What do you think the successor class to the n freeze? and to the South Dakotas might have looked like. Be really interested to hear what you think, and because that's what we're sort of talking about. You know, this is, again, one of the interesting things when you get people writing, looking at ships and going, well, this design would have been most powerful in the world when it was built. Well, we don't have the, the construction plans for that period that line up with it for these major paths, so we have no idea what they built. So I would love to hear what you think might have been built. Thank you very much for watching, and um, if you want to, share pictures of what might have been built on the Discord server, which you should find a link below, and below, but make sure to include a link to that sharing in, your, in a comment down below so people can follow it, because it's always nice for people to find pictures, and then if I do a comment response video, I can tell them to come back and look at the original comments, and they will find links to the photos. And I am planning to do comment response on all the key ships. There is a plan for 60 comment response videos on 60 of the key ship videos over the Christmas period. So that is definitely something which will be done. Wish me luck. And what have we got coming up? This. I'm trying to remember which date it comes on. It's coming out on the 14th of August. So it comes out on the 14th. The next one tomorrow is going to be the building of fleets of Mobile Bay. Oh, that'll be fun. It's a good video. At least, probably the version that you'll see is going to be a good video. I think I'm going to re-record it tomorrow. But today's video has already been a good version. Thank you very much for watching, and um, take care.